to it. But Deuteronomy chapter 27, let's pray and we'll jump in the word. Lord, your word is eternal and it is non-changing, it is powerful, and it is life-changing. And so I pray that as we look at your word tonight, God, and um, we see, Lord, you having your people inscribe your word on stone. Your word truly has literally been inscribed in eternal stone. It can never be changed. And yet when you write your word on that stone and it, Lord, transfers through the cross to our heart, our hearts change from stone to flesh. They become tender. And I thank you for how your eternal word, written with the finger of God in such power, uh, has such transforming power in our lives. And I pray that tonight it would do just that, Lord. Transform us. And I pray for a sweet fellowship night, Lord, that we would just sense your spirit and your power and your goodness, and that you would be the teacher, your Holy Spirit would teach us as we look at your word, and we're excited about what you're going to show us. So, Lord, feed your people, and Lord, we are ready to hear. In Jesus' name, amen. Now, remember, they're coming into the land, getting ready to come into the land, Deuteronomy. We don't have much more to go, actually, in the book of Deuteronomy. A few more chapters, a little bit more, but not a huge amount. And uh, Moses is giving them, Deuteronomy means the second law, really be a great way to kind of sum that up. He's, he's basically taking that new generation that has seen what God has done, um, the first generation really seeing it, some of them as kids seeing it, but now hearing about it and reiterating what they need to do as they go in the promised land. And, and I, what an important thing this is, to pass this on to the next generation. I think uh, where nations go awry is where they don't pass on the word of God to the next generation. And yet I've always known that. I've always known the next generation needs to have the word of God. But I've learned something over the years in walking with the Lord and now being the older generation and seeing the new generation come up. You know, just, just passing the word, along, the word of God along, that's good and that's powerful. But I'm really praying for them to be able to taste what we in the last generation have been able to taste in the Lord. Uh, God did amazing things uh, in America through a, a revival when he poured out his spirit back when I was younger. And God is always doing amazing things, but I really want this next generation to experience God the way that we've had the chance to really experience him. There's nothing like setting a fire in the heart of a person, uh, with just seeing the move of God and just a fresh outpouring of his spirit. So I don't know where that came from other than be praying for it. Pray for God to send a fresh outpouring of his spirit. I know we always talk about revival and we talk about these things and I hope it never becomes cliche or something that we just plan and you know have for several days. There's a revival next week at some church or whatever. We need a real move of God in our nation and, and, and just a real fresh move of God um, in the church. You know, we look at our nation and our nation's a mess and the, the, the frustrating thing to me is, is we know the answers. But when people are a mess, they don't hear the answers. When people's hearts are hard, they won't listen to what the answer is. And so God has to soften the heart. Then they listen to the answer. Then he can really move in a great way to transform a nation. You know, we're going to be getting next week into Deuteronomy chapter 28, which is an amazing chapter. And yet it's a very sad chapter to me as I've been studying, as I studied ahead um, but it reminds me of really where our nation was and where our nation has been. And we can see how God has blessed our nation because we obeyed Deuteronomy 28. And we became the greatest nation on the face of the planet. Probably, the, uh, I think, arguably the greatest nation that's ever existed. Uh, greater than Rome, even, uh, as far as the blessings in just even a material way. Um, uh, of course, Rome was very horribly uh, debauched, if you will. I don't know if that's a word or not, but um, they were a mess. And, um, and yet I see what's happening to America now, and I see the curses coming on America. And, and the frustrating thing is I know the answer. I know what it is that can revive our nation. I know what it is that would turn our nation back to a nation on fire and the leading, leading the world, not just in, wow, what a great economy. I'm not talking about that kind of stuff. In morals, in, 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 in shining a light to a dark world, in making a stand for what's right. And... and uh, Again, it's all right here in God's word, and um, it's, it's, it's exciting that it's here, but it's frustrating. It's almost like um, you're starving to death, and you can see the meal on the other side of the glass, but you can never get to it. And so we'll get to that next week, and yet we can get to it because God can break that glass and send revival. But anyway, uh, I didn't plan on talking about that, but I guess that just uh, um, came out of my heart. But uh, Deuteronomy 27, now we get into, again, as I said, God is not recapping with the children of Israel, the next generation, what they're to do. And he says, now write the law on stones again, just like it was written at the very beginning 40 years earlier. 
Now write it again on, on, on stones to signify the fact that you're reestablishing the word of God as your guide as a nation as we start here in 27. It says, Moses with the elders of Israel commanded the people saying, keep all the commandments which I command you today. And it shall be on the day when you cross over the Jordan to the land which the Lord your God is giving you that you shall set up for yourselves large stones, notice plural there, and whitewash them with lime. So make them white. You shall write on them all the words of this law when you have crossed over, that you may enter the land which the Lord your God is giving you, a land flowing with milk and honey, just as the Lord God of our fathers promised you. Now, there's different debates. You read the scholars, they don't know, and of course they're just giving their opinions, and God doesn't really give us detail on this, but the question is, did they just write the law as in the representative law, the Ten Commandments, like God gave Moses? Or did they write all five books of the Pentateuch? I don't know, but in one way, it's awesome enough that they would take these stones and write God's law on their land. Here's what we believe. Here's what we're going to follow as a nation, and we're not ashamed of it, and no, we're not going to take it down from the courthouse. It is our courthouse, but to think of them writing the entire Pentateuch, the first five books of the Bible, which is all they had at this time as God's word, and writing it out on stones and having it there as a testimony to the nation, maybe they did. And again, he says, write the words of this law, all of the words of this law. So it would appear that's what he's saying. But again, it could just mean the kind of capsulated Ten Commandments as, repre as representative, but powerful statement for the nation. Basically saying, you know what? Um, in God we trust. We're going we, we're gonna to follow the Lord as a nation. And that's what we as a nation have done in the past, and now we're not doing that. And, um, you know, a lot of people wonder about things that happen, and, and, and you know, is it the judgment of God? And you see things that happen around our nation, and you see um, the hurricanes and the storms and mass shootings and uh, the rapes and the murders and the drug problems we have in America. And, and whether or not specifically it's God bringing chastisement on America, some probably is, some probably is not. Uh, here's what we do know. The Bible says that if you dishonor God, he quits protecting you. So basically, it's not that God has to do anything but stop protecting us. And if God stops protecting us, what's going to happen? This kind of stuff. It's amazing to me when I, and I'm not specifically speaking of Las Vegas. That's not, it just is in the forefront when you think about this kind of thing. But I think about, you know, when all the school shootings start beginning and all these other things that began to happen in our schools. It happened when we removed God's word and prayer from our schools. In 1962, we removed prayer. The government said you can't pray anymore in schools, which we all know if there's a test, there's prayer. In 1963, on my birthday, they took the word of God out of schools. June 17th, 1963. That's how I can remember it so clearly. I mean, I didn't remember it then. But, and I don't think it had anything to do with me being born, so don't... don't. <laughs> But if you look at charts and graphs of what happened in our schools after that happened, nosedive. Unbelievable. You get the top 10 lists. If you, if you Google, you know, I know you used to be able to Google it. I don't know if you can anymore, but the top 10 list, you know, prior to 1962 of troubles in schools in America, running in the halls, chewing gum during class. That's two of the top 10. You know what they are today? Rape. Drug abuse, murder sometimes. What happened? We told God, remove those stones that have your commandments on it. Remove them. We don't want them here. And God said, okay. You don't want me or I won't be. I think about, you know, people on the playground that want to beat you up and you've got the biggest friend and everybody's going to touch you while he's there and you make your friend mad and say, get out of here, I never want you to come down here again. And when he's gone, you realize, uh-oh. Now it's me and all these guys that hate me. That's what America's facing. We've said to God, we don't want you. And God's a gentleman. Remember when we went to the Gadarenes, the land of the Gadarenes? That's where the demoniacs were healed. The Lord cast out the demoniac and healed the man and, and the city came out and said, leave. We don't want you here. We don't want your religion. We don't want your thing, whatever you're doing. Leave, please leave. And the Lord didn't demand, oh, I'm staying and you can't make me leave and you will hear this. And that's just it, you know, and put his foot on the front of the boat and pose for the picture, you know, of conquering the gatherings or whatever. He got in the boat and left. He said, you don't want me? Okay. 
I'm not going to force myself on you because I love you. And love doesn't force himself on anyone. True love is, is, is a gentleman. It's gracious. It doesn't force anything. So he left. And they stayed with their demons. You know. And um, I grieve because that's what I see America doing. And, and I see the consequences of it. And you just want to shout out if you would just listen and do it. But the problem is once a heart goes this hard, they just think you're a nut. You have the answers, but they no longer can listen because they've allowed their heart to harden. And so not only are you ignored, you're mocked when you hold the very thing that will save their life, not only as a nation, but eternally. And so God says to them, when you go in, establish me as your God and write it in stone. Don't anybody change it. Don't remove it. Don't worry about equality and letting other religions have their say. Don't worry about, you know, um, uh, being politically correct or offending anyone. Put my word in stone, set it down on the ground, and don't remove it, and I'll bless you. But if you ever turn those stones over face down and say, we no longer want that, he goes, I'll leave you to yourself. Good luck on that one. Because we face a third of the fallen angels who hate our guts. And they want to destroy us. We're no match for them. We can't defend against them. And sadly, the majority of our nation doesn't even believe in them. You know, when you don't believe in your enemy, you have no defense against them. I don't think Satan's real. You talk about a sitting duck. You have no defenses whatsoever. He can easily deceive you. He can easily abuse you because you don't even believe he's real. You've got to know your enemy and know how to fight against him. Uh, you know, if you don't think Satan's real, just... Uh, Join us in ministry for a while. Step out in ministry. Step out and start serving. Those of you that are serving, you step out. You know he's real because the battle begins. And it'll begin with you. It begins against your kids. It begins everywhere. Um, and so he says, write this law. Put it there. Um, and so just as the Lord your God promised you, that verse 4, Therefore it shall be when you have crossed over the Jordan that on Mount Ebal you shall set up these stones which I commanded you today. And you shall whitewash them with lime, and there you shall build an altar to the Lord your God, an altar of stones. You shall not use an iron tool on them. Note that. You shall build them with whole stones, that is not carved and shaped to look all pretty, uh, on the altar of the Lord your God, and offer burnt offerings on it to the Lord your God. I find this interesting. It's not that God is against nice looking things, but God says, when you build me an altar, just use what you have natural. Just take stones, pile them up, put them in a square, put the grate on it, and offer the animals right on that. You don't have to have a perfectly carved, pretty, sparkly, whatever, this kind of thing. Why? Because God wants the attention to be on him, not on the altar. My, you know, everything we do here at the church, we try to do with excellence. We're about to, God willing, start into some new projects on the land. I know you've been hearing that for a long time, but I think we're really about to get close. And even with this project, you know, people drive up and they see the outside of the building and they walk inside and they say, wow, I had no idea this was in here. Why? We're not trying to impress people with carved stones. But the Bible says do everything unto the Lord with what? With excellence. And I always tell the staff, we, we want to serve the Lord with excellence, not opulence. And there's a difference. Excellence not opulence. Opulence, the diamonds everywhere, the sparkly gold, the flashy. When you serve God with opulence, what happens is everybody looks around, wow, 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 who did this? Wow, look at that, wow, wow. Oh, we just worshiped, didn't we? Wow, wow, wow. What do you say? I don't know, but did you see that ceiling in that place? I mean, who paints like that? Wow. What's happening? God's not getting the glory, man is. And God says, you don't need something fancy and ornate. You don't have to go overboard with it. Do it with excellence. If you're going to serve God, do it right. Don't serve him second skimmings. But you don't have to be the fanciest, most ornate thing around because the problem with that is it oftentimes gets the eyes on the thing rather than on the Lord. He says, I want your eyes on me. So just do a basic, simple, grab the stones, build it neatly, put it in order, do it with excellence, and, and, and honor me in that. You shall offer peace offerings, and you shall eat there and rejoice before the Lord your God. You shall write very plainly on the stones all the words of this law. And Moses and the priests and the Levites spoke to all of Israel, saying, Take heed and listen, O Israel. This day you've become the people of the Lord your God. 
Therefore you shall obey the voice of the Lord your God and serve his and observe his commandments, his statutes, which I command you this day. And now he's going to go into this thing of cursings and blessings, and we'll get into it again. We'll, just, we'll finish this chapter, but get into it again in chapter 28. But I want to make a statement, just a general statement before we even read this. This is just a truism from Scripture. If you obey the Lord, your life will be blessed. If you disobey the word of God, your life will be cursed. Again, balance. It doesn't mean that Christians don't go through terribly hard times, that they don't have traumatic times. It doesn't mean that a Christian couldn't even die at a mass shooting somewhere. It doesn't mean that. Sometimes that happens. But it means life in general, you will be blessed. But if you don't obey God, you will be cursed. You know, when you see kids rebel, and I'm not going to do it this, I'm not going to do the Bible. So like, you can do that. You can choose to rebel. Or, or adults even. I, you, know, you say kids. Even us as adults, we can choose to rebel. Kids can rebel. But I will guarantee you, you will be cursed. Guaranteed. No, I will do it I want. I'm going to have fun. You will be cursed. It may take a couple of years. You may have a big time for three, four, or five years. But you will be cursed cursed. Why? God is not mocked. And God says, if you obey me in my word, you'll be blessed. If you don't obey me in my word and you reject it, you will be cursed. It's just true. So some of us can delay it longer than others. God holds off longer than others with some. I don't know why. But it's, it's, it's a law of the universe that will never, ever change. You know, my hope is, is that um, people learn it earlier than I did, that you don't waste 25 years of your life you know, as an idiot, I was cursed for 25 years. And after 25 years of cursing and my life being destroyed, I finally said, you know, something's not right here. Duh. How long does it take you, Mark? I hope you're smarter than I am. I hope you're more tender and more sensitive than I am. But I just am thankful that God loved me enough to come after me anyway. We serve a great God, don't we? He's a good Lord. So now we get into it. Look at 11. And Moses commanded the people on the same day, saying, These shall stand on Mount Gerizim to bless the people where you've crossed over the Jordan. Simeon, Levi, Judah, Issachar, Joseph, and Benjamin, so those tribes. And these tribes shall stand on Mount Ebal to curse. Reuben, Gad, Asher, Zebulun, Dan, and Naphtali. So these two mountains, I've seen them. They're very close together. They're near Jacob's well. Uh, in the area of Samaria. And um, so it would have been very easy to hear each other. And of course, sound travels great there in the Middle East. But one here on this mountain, one on the other mountain, and one's going to declare, okay, this is going to happen if you obey. And everybody, amen. This is going to happen if you're cursed. Amen. So he's just saying, I want you to hear it. I know you know it. I've told you, but I want you to hear it and recognize these are the things that are going to happen. And so um, notice what he says here, verse 14. And the Levites shall speak with a loud voice and say to all the men of Israel, Cursed is the one who makes a carved or molded image, an abomination to the Lord, the work of the hands of the craftsman, and sets it up in secret. And I find that interesting. Well, notice, and all the people shall answer and say, Amen. Now imagine this. First of all, I'll give you the scene that's happening. Then I'm going to get back to that verse. You've got two million people. And a million or so scattered over one side, that mountain all up and down and down in the valley on both sides, no doubt covering the whole mountain and down over it, just like a big anthill. All these people, another big anthill, all these people up over the top, back down, just rows and rows and massive. And I've seen those mountains, a million on each side. It would have been massive crowds there. Think about the noise when they shout, when the, when the Levites, cursed is the one who makes a molded image. And does it in secret. And all of you, amen. I mean, think about it. You think about it. Okay, Nayland Stadium, 100,000 people. Go Vols, right? I mean, not so much right now, but. <laughs> but you get my point. When they are really into it and there's people there cheering. Imagine 100,000 times 20. Is my math right? Is that 10 million? Oh, good. I'm so bad at math. I want to check. Think about that. 20 Nayland stadiums. Amen. Wow. You talk about echoing to the, the whole nation and the surrounding. Everybody around the world go, my goodness. 
You know, and so they're shouting this out. But notice what it is they're saying. Not even that you're not to build a molded image or have these carved images of, of things that could lead to you worshiping them or whatever, this kind of thing. He says, and, and if you set them up in secret, he's not just saying out in public. He says, don't even think you can get away. If you do this in secret and nobody knows, you're still going to be cursed. Wow. Pretty heavy. He says, God sees it. We think, oh, nobody sees it. Nobody sees what I do at night, you know, when I turn on the Internet. God sees it. You're going to be cursed. Trust me, your family will be cursed. It's gonna, it's gonna, there's going to be a payday. You cannot do th anything in secret that is wrong, that is not an open scandal in heaven, and that God's not going to deal with, especially as a believer. And so this is good for us to know it. It should put a godly fear in our heart. Look at 16. Cursed is the one who treats his father and his mother with contempt. And all the people shall say, amen. This giant roar again, you know, showing respect for, for, for the parents. 17, cursed is the one who moves his neighbor's landmark. Again, they would stack, remember the stones showing the landmark. And if you move that landmark, um, he says you're going to be cursed because God sees it. God sees you out there at night moving that landmark. Cursed is the one who makes the blind to wander off the road. And the people shall say, amen. Isn't it sad God even has to say that? Look at the sin nature. I think a lot of people are struggling right now about the shooter in Las Vegas because he obviously was not insane. He planned it out. He was very smart, very methodical, very wealthy, made his plans, carried out the plan beautifully. I mean, now, again, it depends on the definition of insane. I guess we could make an argument, yeah, maybe he was in some degree. But he obviously had his mental faculties working very nicely. And he, he, he wasn't like just unable to think and unable to focus and just, you know, whatever. He was like... This guy was, so people struggle with that. They say, he seemed, now I don't know what they're going to say about this guy. But you hear about a lot of these shooters, they go, he seems so normal. You would never know anything was wrong. He's just a normal guy. Sometimes they even say, this person was pretty nice really, and I just can't believe this happened. Here's why. The Bible says that we are intrinsically evil. The heart is desperately wicked. The Bible says man is born evil. The only reason we do any good is because we were raised with morals in our families. So we do some good and we struggle with evil on the inside, don't we? Even while we're doing good, we have evil thoughts. We, we do things we shouldn't do growing up. And even once we're grown up and we think things we shouldn't think, and yet we know it's not right. So we, we don't do it and we restrain ourselves because of the laws of the land and because we've been raised with morals from our parents. And then when we give our life to the Lord, now Jesus moves in and the Holy Spirit begins to restrain us more. But if it wasn't for that, guys, we could, we could do the most wicked of things. So man by his nature is, is sinful at heart. So when people see things like this, they can't understand how could someone just do this? What would cause anyone? Well, you know, there could have been drugs involved. There could have been all kinds of things. We don't know. And so I'm not saying that he was thinking normally. Don't get me wrong when I say he obviously had his ability, though, to, to, to think clear enough to make amazing plans and carry them out. That doesn't mean he wasn't deranged, okay? So I'm not saying he wasn't. And more details will come out later. But a lot of times you do hear about these people that they just nobody can understand. You never saw it coming. You know, how could that happen? I mean... It's just amazing. And yet, why? Because at the heart of man, you know, there's that sin nature. And so blind people getting off the road, I mean, that is, again, sounds more like stuff kids would do, but God tells them everybody. And so they say, amen, you can't do that. Cursed is the one who perverts the justice due the stranger, the fatherless, and the widow. And the people shall say, Amen. That is when you have people in your land that are from another country and they don't live in that area, or they even people that just moved to your area that might even be Americans, but especially people that come in from the outside, treat them with love. Love them, help them, respect them. Try to, you know, how would you like it if you were in a foreign country and you didn't know anything and you didn't know the language and you didn't, you're thankful when somebody's there to watch over you and help you if you've ever traveled like that before. God's saying, do that. And you're cursed if you don't. He says, and the, amen. He goes on, look at this, verse 20. Cursed is the one who lies with his father's wife because he, he has uncovered his father's bed and all the people shall say amen. Now, it, it's bad, but probably not as bad as you're thinking. We're thinking just generally incest, you know, a child of the actual parents. No, back then they had multiple wives. Uh, many of them did in that culture. And so because of that, it would, possibly, it would typically be when this happened, a different wife than their, you know, than their own mom, obviously, or, or than, you know, whatever. It's still just as horrible, but it's not as directly horrible, so to speak. But in any case, either way, he's saying, no, you can't do that. Remember, that's what Reuben did. 
you know, Reuben took one of the wives uh, of Jacob and lay with her. And so um, God said about Reuben, you're, un you're as unstable as water. You know, you'll, never, you'll never prosper. There was a curse on the, on the tribe of Reuben because of that. You'll make okay sandwiches, but you're not going to do good pretty much anywhere else. Sorry. Verse 21, cursed is the one who lies with any kind of animal. And all the people shall say, amen. Now you think about that, and that's as abhorrent as that is to us, guys, that's not new. That's been happening for centuries. And yes, it happens sometimes in America. I read just this last week again in the main news headlines. There it was. Somebody, you know, involved with an animal. You think, how disgusting. How could anyone do that? Again, it's amazing when, when people turn away from God what the heart of man can dissolve into. And God says, you'll be cursed if you do that. And God has to, again, it's amazing that God even has to say not to do that. But he does. So amen. Again, I remember, I, I will say, make one other comment. Don't worry, I'm not going to talk long about this or, or, or make any comments that I shouldn't make. But in the news, there was a guy a few years ago wanting to marry his pet lamb or something. He, he literally went to the officials trying to have a legal marriage. And you think, how perverted can a society become? How, how perverted can a person become, you know? And anyway. Notice verse 22, cursed is the one who lies with his sister, the daughter of his father, or the daughter of his mother. Now, again, this would be bad, but not as bad as we're thinking in the sense of you, if you had multiple wives, there'd be multiple daughters that would be removed from your mom and dad, so to speak, or from the mom, you know, separated because of the different marriage. But either way, God says, no, this is incest. Don't do this. Um, and so, yo, you, you can't do that. Cursed is the one who does that. And all the people get, amen, you know. Cursed is the one who lies with his mother-in-law. And all the people shall say, amen. You know, this huge crowd. Cursed is the one who attacks his neighbor secretly. That is, you do something against your neighbor that's wrong, and you know, you're, you're, you're tearing them down in secret. And all the people shall say, amen. And cursed is the one who takes a bribe to slay an innocent person. And all the people shall say to the Congress, amen. <laughs> they didn't say to the Congress. I added that part. Um, but again, that's a huge problem. People that take bribes when they're in positions of leadership and they do a lot of damage to others because they're, they're doing it for the money. He says, don't be motivated by the money. And this one is huge. Notice as we finish the chapter, look at this, verse 26. Cursed is the one who does not confirm all the words of this law and all the people shall say amen. In other words, cursed is the one who, do, who does not confirm and believe all of the Bible. Think about that. How many people today don't believe the Bible? How many people today deny the Bible? How many people today change the Bible? You know, we're going to talk about this more on Sunday, but you guys kind of get a sneak preview because you're here on Wednesday night. But I, I you know, these people that... Um, they're making these translations now where they take out portions of the Bible because they just don't really like it. Or they're making them gender neutral. God says, you don't mess with my word. I wrote it how I meant it. Don't change it. It's one thing to translate it and make it modern. There's nothing wrong in that. But if God says he's a he, he's a he. Whether it fits your political position or not. You know, and I see these gender neutral Bibles coming out and people are doing them because they say, well, you know, it's offensive to some people. And, and, uh, and so, you know, uh, I saw a school just recently, they, they were teaching the kids, they had to teach them the, I guess it was the declaration, you know, that God has created all men and they changed it. God has created all humankind. Now that's just the declaration of independence. That's not, you know. You're not messing with God's word, but it shows you how a society goes, well, that's not fair. We need to make sure that everyone... When you say mankind, God's including everyone. I think we get that. But when God says here, he says, cursed is the one who does not confirm all the words of this law. I believe everything the Bible says, and I teach every bit of it. And if there's something that somebody has a problem with, that's between them and God. You know, I can't change that. And there's a lot of pressure on believers today because of it, what cultural issues, political issues. Oh, do you really think homosexuality is wrong? The Bible clearly says that it is. Do you really think they won't go to heaven? The Bible clearly says they won't. But I know people that are homosexual and they're Christians. Well, no, they're not. Because either they're telling the truth or God is. It's not a matter of hating anybody. It's not a matter of being ugly. 
It's confirming all the words of God's word, and we have to stand on it. We can't change it because God says, I wrote it in stone. It's not to be changed. And what I said, I mean, and, you know, that's just one of many issues that are out there. But, again, God takes his word very seriously, and we should take it very seriously as well. So a little bit more of a somber night. It wasn't too somber, but kind of somber. Hearing all the curses, ooh, you know, tell me when it's over. Hide behind the umbrella, right? That's a Rudolph thing. Anyway. But let's just pray for God to really, again, you know, not only burn his word in our heart, but let's just stand firm on it. Not be afraid in the days we live. Yeah, people will mock us. They'll make fun of us. They'll give us a hard time. But can you imagine standing before the Lord on judgment day and saying, I stood on it anyway? Can you imagine all the, all the believers there and people that are cowering away saying, I didn't want to stand on it because I didn't want to make a stand and I didn't want to get in trouble and I didn't want people to hate me and not yell at me. The Lord will still love them. If they know him, they'll still get in the kingdom. They'll still be accepted. But how much more wonderful to stand before the Lord and say, you know what? They mocked me, made fun of me, said I was a whatever, and all the names they want to say. But Lord, I didn't change your word, and I stood on it. Well done. Well done. Imagine how you're going to feel that day. You wouldn't trade that for the world, you know? And everybody that didn't do it is going to be going, I wish, I just wish, I just, mm. And so the reward's going to be wonderful. Don't be afraid of people. Fear the Lord and love people. Stand on his word. Let's pray and ask God to, to really just burn that in our hearts. Father, burn that in our hearts tonight, Lord. We want to love you and fear you and stand on your word. And we don't want to ever, God, be ashamed of you. We never want to deny you. And although we may in our weakness be ashamed at some moment or deny at some moment, we know you'll forgive us and you'll restore us. But Lord, we don't want to. We want to stand firm. And as we see a culture and a society standing around us, Lord, not only telling us that we're haters and that we're bigoted for declaring what your word says, but some even trying to pass laws that all say what your word says is illegal. I thank you that hasn't happened yet. And I pray that it doesn't happen. But God, I see where our society is going. And I don't fear for myself or for the church. I fear for this society. Lord, we're going to be fine. We're going to be fine. We have glory waiting on us. But God, those who reject you, they only have eternal separation and damnation and cursing. Have mercy on them, Lord. And help us to be merciful toward them and gracious toward them and show our love for them. And I pray, God, that, um, Lord, you would send revival. God, send revival to this nation. God, restore the church and get us back to the place of blessing. Lord, I know I'm getting ahead of myself in ch from chapter 28, but I, I, I just can't help but think about, Lord, how you've blessed our nation and how I'm watching the blessings slip away and we are choosing to do it. It's heartbreaking and devastating. Wake us up, Lord. Wake up the church. Wake up our nation and restore us, God. We need a revival. Lord, I pray you would just bless our time tonight. And um, Lord, as we prepare our hearts for communion, I pray, God, that you would just help us to confess our sin and get our heart clean before you as we just have a time of just being quiet before you and seeking you and getting ready to remember what you did in your body and how you, Lord, gave your blood for us on that cross so that we could be forgiven. We love you, Lord, and we thank you and ask it in Jesus' name. Amen.